Welcome to this Washington Institute Policy Forum on the Economic Future of Northeast Syria. I'd like to take a moment today to start and introduce our um, two speakers, along with myself. We have Jennifer Caffarello, who is the National Security Fellow at the Institute for the Study of War and a visiting fellow at George Mason University's National Security Institute focusing on US defense strategy. She is joining us today to focus on the military dynamics and the counter ISIS fight and how that ties into the economic considerations in Northeast Syria. And recently she spoke at a house subcommittee examining the ongoing conflict in Syria, which will also factor in our half hour discussion today before we go into uh, a Q and A um, in a more open dialogue session. Um, our other speaker is Sasha Ghosh Simonoff. He's the executive director and co-founder of People Demand Change, a startup that focuses on monitoring and evaluating humanitarian aid and development programs and providing long-term solutions for these issues in the Middle East, including Syria. Um, he's working on stabilization activities in the NES in Northeastern Syria, and that he and his um, 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 uh, startup is keeping track of humanitarian stabilization activities in that region as part of their work. So he's got excellent vis visibility on the issues um, as they're developing now. Um, I'm pleased to have them here with me after I returned from a recent trip to Northeastern Syria. I'm the inaugural journalist in residence at the Washington Institute, um, and I've spent the last five years focused on Iraq and Syria as my reporting for um, magazines such as The New Yorker, uh, The Atlantic, uh, The New York Times, and many others. Um, I have written extensively on my trip for the Institute's FICRA Forum, and I encourage our viewers and uh, participants today to, to go and check out uh, FICRA Forum and the Washington Institute's website to find um, more about my trip and more insight and policy analysis um, on Syria and America's future there. Um, thank you to Jenny and uh, Sasha for coming today. I really just wanted to uh, you know, not only thank you, but also say that I'm excited to have this conversation having come on the heels of this trip. Um, so many questions that I have, and I know so many questions uh, people have about the region and sort of America's role um, in um, Northeastern Syria, but more particularly the economic question of how um, we've transitioned from a kinetic um, environment into our stabilization, um, you know, forward looking um, environment. Um, in that part of the country. So I'm hoping to just have an open discussion and, and, and get your insights into the region. And then a little bit past half past the hour, we'll open it up to our attendees and, and Q&A um, for those in attendance. Um, if you'd like to submit a question, you can do it through the Q&A function in Zoom, or you can email policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org um, and, and, and we can answer them. Um, as we go along. So I want to start with uh, Jenny, you testify or you, you spoke before a House subcommittee last week, um, examining the ongoing conflict in Syria. And it was a really interesting conversation because there were so many different perspectives on what the US should do, right? There was some conflicting interests. There was also some conflicting insight, but your takeaway you shared with me before we started was that there seemed to be some real bipartisan support into um, into remaining in, in Northeastern Syria and remaining in Syria writ large. Could you speak a little bit more about um, how those efforts relate to uh, the economic component that we're seeing now in uh, the region? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Uh, first, for your excellent reporting on this issue. Uh, and secondly, for convening Sasha and I for this discussion. And thanks to Washington Institute as well. Uh, the situation in Syria is, of course, difficult. And it's one of those policy challenges that I honestly would not wish upon any American president or, or administration, uh, because Syria is indeed a mess. It remains a, a deeply fractured country that unfortunately uh, is going to remain a war zone, I think, for the foreseeable future, um, in no small part because no actor on the ground in Syria has the capability to seize and hold the entire country. That includes the Assad regime, uh, but also because Assad and his backers have consistently spoiled uh, the diplomatic process to end the war through a negotiated settlement. So when the U.S. is considering what to do about the instability that Syria causes, including the Salafi Jihadi terrorist groups that continue to operate on the battlefield, we have to acknowledge the unfortunate reality that a decade into this conflict, you know, there's no straightforward way out and there's no straightforward you know, option to end the conflict. It's in that context that I thought the House Foreign Affairs uh, Committee subcommittee hearing last week was so important. Uh, that subcommittee really is demonstrating bipartisan leadership on continuing to raise awareness of what American interests are at stake inside of Syria, 
um, but also in crafting you know, options for US policy through legislation um, that actually reflected bipartisan, bipartisan consensus uh, that's so rare, uh, unfortunately, in today's political environment. So some of the natures of the debates that we had uh, at the committee last week and that perhaps we can discuss here today include what actors the United States can and should partner with or expect to play a constructive role inside of Syria. Um, and the key point, I think, of tension is with respect to the Russian presence. There are a lot of folks that look at the Russians and say, you know, can we just ask the Russians to handle this? Can we kind of off offload this onto them and let them deal with it? Um, and I understand that's a, an attractive prospect kind of logically, um, but unfortunately the reality on the ground is that the Russians are in Syria in order to gain leverage over NATO that's deeply destabilizing. Uh, and the Russians can't actually provide the kind of security that the United States needs. And so I don't think the Russians are a solution inside of Syria. Um, they're also playing a very active spoiling role in preventing humanitarian aid from entering Syria. And again, preventing that diplomatic settlement from occurring. So as we look at the U.S. position in the Northeast, um, simply handing that over to Russia or supporting an agreement where Russia and the Assad regime, you know, kind of come east and, and take control is actually not going to be viable. It's going to cause more instability uh, rather than the kind of stability that would provide the opportunity for this population to prosper economically uh, and to recover from such a devastating war. I want to get to Sasha here in a minute, but just to just to follow on that, it's um, such an interesting and complex situation. But from your vantage point, as someone who's focusing on the military aspect and um, the, the non-state actors who are operating within northeastern Syria, um, like you said, partnering with some of these forces, but also engaging with and actively managing the factions that are perhaps stirring up issues within the region? Is there still an ISIS component that is damaging the economy or is ISIS still fractured in such a way that it's no longer part of that equation? Sure, so what the approximately 900 US forces who are deployed in Eastern Syria have been able to achieve and to maintain is truly remarkable in my view. That's a very small force presence that's enabling a minimum level of security and stability in the roughly one third of Syrian territory that our local partner at the SDF uh, controls. That's incredible. And what, what those forces are enabling is a level of sustained pressure on ISIS's remnants across Eastern Syria that is preventing those remnants from having the kind of success that ISIS is having in the areas Russia is responsible for just across the, the bank, um, on the Western bank of the Euphrates River, where in that regime controlled area, uh, we're seeing the worst ISIS resurgence. It's a very sophisticated and sustained military operations that you don't see on the Eastern Bank. And that's no small part uh, a function of the support the US is providing to the SDF. But the challenge here is, as you alluded to in your question, there are many sources of pressure, military and in terms of governance on the SDF. That includes a low level campaign of ISIS assassinations, which aren't causing massive instability, but are starting to degrade that governance project and the security while driving social tensions that could themselves undermine the SDF. And I flag that not necessarily because ISIS is going to succeed in unraveling this single-handedly, but because the Russians, the Iranians, and the Assad regime see this opportunity to cause instability and perhaps create opportunity for themselves to expand and are actually adding to that campaign by conducting their own assassinations, trying to reach out and recruit on the Eastern Bank. Uh, and that actually the composite of all of those sources of pressure could over time begin to degrade what the SDF is capable of. And potentially, if we're not careful, make that U.S. military position more untenable over the long term. I want to remind our participants and attendees that you can also submit questions through the Zoom Q&A function or uh, by submitting a note to uh, policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. I think that's, that's, that's what I found a lot during my recent visit, which was um, through the bulk of March. And I had been to northeastern Syria in 2018 and 2019, shortly after the withdrawal announcement um, or the drawdown announcement. And there seems now to be this effective push, or at least it's taking hold, this, this undermining of the self-administration and the governance structure there, um, using all of these components to make the, the, the citizenship and, um, and, and people living in northeastern Syria less likely to support 
uh, the SDF and and um, and the self administration for all these reasons. And I think from what I heard and what I'm reporting on that the economic question, um, the fact that so much is uh, is is hinged on whether or not the U.S. stays or how Russia plays into this component or whether or not ISIS is going to continue offering um, great salaries is uh, undermining what the SDF and the self-administration, as you pointed out, have been able to accomplish over these uh, last four or five years. Um, Sasha, I wanted to turn to you and ask, how are you seeing it play out on the ground with your employees and the people you work with, uh, the locals you work with? Um, are they feeling the same sort of tension when it comes to um, uh, their belief in the abilities of the self-administration and what economic future there may or may not be in that region? Sure. So I think um, it's a very important to consider that in each sort of province or subregion of the NES area, they have different dynamics. Either they experienced various micro conflicts uh, at the beginning of uh, the revolution, then they experienced perhaps markedly different um, situation under the occupation of ISIS, and then they were also liberated from ISIS at varying times. So some areas, for example, you know, they were liberated in late 2016 or 2017. They may or may not have had more time and capacity to uh, receive um, stabilization funds, rehabilitate their communities. Some areas were liberated, you know, as late as I think, you know, um, early 2020 or late 2019. So um, you have a lot of gradients of, of recovery going on across the area. And that has created um, different issues that each community is addressing. In addition, um, the way in which uh, both the SDF and the Assad regime went about kicking ISIS out of Northeast Syria means that um, you have a lot of disconnect of economic systems and hubs that used to be connected that are no longer the case. So there was used to be tons of cross river trade between portions of Derazor on the eastern and western banks between the major cities of Derazor City, Mayadeen, and, and Abu Kamel. All these cities uh, that are on the western bank are under the regime. And the, the amount of trade that can be done with the SDF side is minimal. So people are having to reorient and reroute their entire systems of, of economy and trade. Uh, north and east back towards the, the KRG Iraq border. And it's just a very different way in which people are trading and operating and working with one another. It's, uh, it's not the normal pace pre, pre-conflict. And as a result, it means that simultaneously uh, the SDF and the self-administration authority is having to grapple with a new economic mechanism or way in which people are trading while simultaneously having to deal with security. Uh, after the 2019 invasion, the Turks you know, set up their front line basically along the M4, which was a major economic route that spanned the entire north of Syria so that even before, um, before this, current, this current crisis um, in 2019, there was still a trade that was moving across the country between different areas of control. Now, a lot of that has stopped. People are not using the M4 in the way in which people are able to move uh, between, let's say, Derazor and Raqqa is really constrained because they can no longer use the M4. And on top of that, the roads that are available run through uh, sparsely populated rural areas in which ISIS and other elements like the, like the Assad regime or others can take advantage to create problems that then reduces uh, the capacity to safely trade and move goods and services. And that also creates a difficulty that the SDF has to contend with because as soon as you have a drop in services, you have discontent. And that's just, there's just a clear correlation there right now. So uh, US is focusing a lot on Derazor. Um, the humanitarian sector is focusing a lot on Hasaka and Raqqa uh, and, uh, and the um, Kobani district uh, in Aleppo. So we have some delineation of services, um, but there's still a lot of gaps and there needs to be a lot higher level of coordination between all the international funders in terms of the types of projects and programs they're implementing on the ground. Now, when I was out in Northeastern Syria, I also learned that there was still quite a bit of smuggling going on between those routes that you said were once established and are now no longer sort of the main 
um, thoroughfares of, uh, of trade. Um, so I think that should be noted as well. But what you mentioned about Operation Peace Spring and how that sort of reached almost to M4 um, and, and broke into the country's uh, Northeast, that seems to have, in my mind, answered what you note in these different delineation, you said delineating of funds and resources to these different cantons, these different areas. Um, that sort of pushed a lot of the effort of the self-administration, the SDF up north. Is that, I would, is that accurate? Because they're more focused on doing work and rehabilitation and reconstruction in an area that they feel is, is um, working for them, in an area that they feel has been uh, beneficial to them and is worth their time and investment as opposed to say in Deir Azor where things uh, like Jenny noted are a little bit more content way to look at where we are in terms of the developmental stages in these in these areas in Hasaka and and farther and up near Komishlo and then down near Deir Azor and out in Kobani either one of you can grab it sure so I'll, I'll start and just offer uh, the reflection that what the SDF is trying to do and the self-administration um, that governs this area is a pretty impossible task. They're spread way too thin, they don't have the resources and they're under an incredible amount of pressure. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I advocate that the US needs to remain inside of Syria because if the US presence uh, is removed, the SDF is not going to be able to sustain what it's doing. Uh, and it's only the partnership with the United States that is actually making much of this possible. Uh, and I start there because I think it's important to acknowledge that the SDF is a coalition of Syrian Kurdish uh, forces, some of whom are linked to the PKK, um, as, as Turkey is concerned about, um, but also a significant number of Arab components that decided to join uh, with that Kurdish leadership in order to defeat ISIS. Uh, and that coalition between Syrian Kurds and the predominantly Arab population in eastern Syria has actually been able to endure quite a bit of pressure um, during and then after the fight against ISIS. And the, it is true that the self-administration is tending to prioritize um, reconstruction in areas farther north uh, towards Turkey. And there are some very concerning reports, for example, that some of the aid uh, funding and, and other supplies you know, get privileged to Kurdish areas. Um, or areas of greater strategic value vis-a-vis -vis Turkey over some of the areas that need it even more, uh, including down south in Deir Ezzor province. Uh, but I actually have been consistently impressed by the extent to which the military and civilian leadership of the SDF and the self-administration has acknowledged the importance of maintaining Deir Ezzor and ensuring that Deir Ezzor does not fall back to the Islamic State um, or to you know, Assad, the Russians, and the Iranians. I think it hasn't gone far enough and I think more prioritization of that area is absolutely essential. Um, but so far the SDF leadership has, has demonstrated that they see uh, the challenge that they're up against and they do acknowledge um, that you know, the pressure in Deir Ezzor could in fact be the scene um, that causes that Kurdish uh, Arab uh, alignment to fracture. And I think this is an area in which I would like to see much more US attention. Um, the forces that are there are attempting to mediate these tensions and they're doing a great job, but they don't have the resources or the capacity to do it at the scale that they need. Um, and the US needs to get civilian uh, counterparts back into Syria. Right now, the, the military conditions don't allow it, um, but we need State Department personnel down there. We need better stabilization assistance. We can't expect that the SDF itself is just going to be able uh, to handle what is seriously a remarkable level um, of tension and military requirements to say nothing of the scope and scale of the rebuilding that actually needs to happen, um, which I know Sasha can, can speak to much in much greater detail. Right, so, you know, the, um, the uh, self-administration, the AANES, has gone through uh, a tidal wave of changes since its founding. Um, it's had numerous iterations moving from like a canton system to a more provincial-based system. Um, it incorporated territory as it was literally like rebuilding itself. And every time new territory was added, they had to consider those populations, what to do with them, how far to incorporate them into their project and under what basis they made deals based on the political and military considerations at the time. So for example, um, you'll see that there's a lot more, let's say political connective tissue between AANES, between Hasaka, Raqqa and Kobani versus there's a higher degree of autonomy for the areas in Deir Ezzor because that was the deal they had to make in order to ensure that the tribal components 
in Deir ez that wanted to fight ISIS would be on board with the day after ISIS left. So as a result, um, you have different layers of uh, political and civil uh, bureaucracy that operates. It's not always all the same, and it requires you to talk to a lot of people in order to operate on the ground. However, I think what everyone in the region uh, realizes is that at the end of the day, each province and each region has something the other province wants. Hasika, you know, is called the breadbasket of Syria. It has tons of uh, wheat and other core staples. Uh, Derizor, yes, it has oil, which is important, but also it has a water, has tons of water because it has the Euphrates River running through it. Right now, the Khabur River, which runs through Hasaka province, is either uh, dry or badly damaged. And they are pumping water from the Euphrates River all the way north into Hasaka to help irrigate. Uh, Raqqa, I mean, they used to grow tons of cotton and other staples as well. Um, they were, you know, they're like Raqqa city was like a key trading, trading center for that area. So no province or no sub region of NES can go it alone. They need something else from their neighbor. And so from an economic and stabilization standpoint, everyone needs to cooperate and work together to, to make this work. And I think there is a realization that that's a necessity, but that also requires political compromise. And it also requires considering uh, the ethno demographics of the region of the region and how to provide political uh, voice to all societal components that are that are living in this area. The START program and UNICEF are working along the middle Euphrates River Valley and, and north and Hajin and, and in that area of Deir Azur. Are they offering funds for development and offering um, opportunities for development, both um, economical, but also, I guess, um, residential and, and, and things to prevent any sort of these uh, ad hoc ID, IDP camps that we're seeing along uh, the middle U Euphrates River Valley? Sasha? Sure. So like there are stabilization funds that are provided by USAID that are going towards a series of implementers who have a variety of tasks and priorities. A lot of it is uh, rehabilitation of core infrastructure, electricity, roads, rubble removal. Um, some of it is also removing remnants of war. That was kind of earlier on in the process, but it's still a concern. Uh, and then there's other projects that focus on uh, agriculture and livelihoods development. Uh, we personally work on updating and rehabilitating wash infrastructure, so pumping stations, canals, that sort of thing. And USAID um, isn't the only one funding this. There's funds from the EU, there's funds from uh, Canadians um, and others who are basically part of the anti-ISIS coalition. So the idea in, in Derizor and parts of Raqqa, it's about helping to ensure that communities that uh, lived under ISIS um, are provided a chance to rehabilitate themselves and have some societal cohesion again. In terms of the UN, I can't speak exactly to what, if they're doing anything on the development side, but certainly on the humanitarian side, they have a bunch of partners, they're implementing uh, you know, uh, NFI provision and emergency food aid and that sort of things, because at the end of the day, we still have an acute humanitarian crisis and on top of that, we also now have COVID-19 as an issue, and there are now rolling lockdowns in parts of Hasaka and in other areas of NES to try and combat because frankly, they don't have the healthcare infrastructure required to deal with such a, a, a tough thing as COVID-19. And that also has an impact on people's livelihoods and, uh, and the economy writ large. Some of these efforts, at least for the, the United States part are, vastly different than what the State Department was saying they were contributing back in 2018, uh, the Battle for Raqqa, um, saying that they would only rebuild infrastructure that was destroyed on the part of the coalition, right? I mean, this is totally different than where we saw ourselves three years ago. Um, should we anticipate more changes moving forward in this way, Jenny, or is, or is this sort of just a, um, a, a small little token to uh, the Northeast for the, the, the dual betrayals, if I may? Look, I hope to see more changes. And I think it's important to recognize that this has been somewhat of an emergent strategy inside of Syria. And what I mean by that is, 
we intervened to stop the ISIS rampage across the Northeast. And we did it to back a local partner that, you know, was on its last leg, um, suffered, you know, significant losses and, and might have been defeated. And we then took that partner um, and built them up into this military uh, force that is now a coalition, as I mentioned, um, of Kurds and Arabs and a governing partner. That's not something you can, you know, neatly plan from phase A, you know, all the way to the end of the conflict and have this beautiful strategy that proceeds. You, you just can't do that. It's not realistic, especially in a conflict as vicious and fast moving and complex as Syria. So it's important for the U.S. to set, you know, interim goals that are achievable and then reevaluate. OK, what's the next stage? How do we get closer to the outcome that we are, are pursuing from here? And the counter ISIS campaign has demonstrated exactly that kind of frequent recalibration in order to make sure what the U.S. is doing is actually still advancing towards the outcome that we need. In the first instance, defeating the physical caliphate and now preventing it from resurging, essentially, or preventing a massive destabilization caused by the Turks or other actors that would create the vacuum allowing ISIS to resurge. So that kind of reevaluation can actually be a very constructive thing. And I think so far it has been. Um, but some of the instincts of the previous administration and, and former President Trump were actually to just declare success and, and kind of cut and run. Um, and as we saw, when the U.S. actually considers what will it look like if the U.S. cuts and run, the outcomes are far worse. Um, and so I, I was very glad to see the administration, walk, the former administration, walk back on that withdrawal. And my hope is that this administration will recognize that we have something good here. The United States has achieved a very important outcome with our local partners that could be lost. And if we don't actually allocate more stabilization funding, and if we don't support the SDF at this strategically important moment, we may see those hard fought gains unravel. And look, the next time, if ISIS is able to take terrain again, it's gonna be even messier and even more difficult for the United States uh, to defeat you know, that terrorist army if it's able to reconstitute. And I think this is a lesson that we should have learned by now. Uh, we should have learned this when the US withdrew from Iraq in 2011. Unfortunately, we're seeing the mistake of just bailing um, from conflicts being repeated now in Afghanistan. And so my hope is that the administration can recognize the strategic value of what we've achieved in Syria um, and how important a relatively small commitment on the grand scale of things um, in terms of humanitarian um, and development assistance can actually have strategic geopolitical consequences, um, both in preventing you know, an ISIS reconstitution, um, but also, as I mentioned earlier, um, keeping this portion of Syria um, stable and you know, hopefully over time more prosperous so that other malign actors that seek to use it for their own regional ambitions like Iran um, and Russia can't actually essentially sweep up the gains that the U.S. and our local partners fought so hard for. I, I think the considerations that are being made now by this administration um, in northeast, northeastern Syria are really difficult because at once, and this sort of goes to the point of, of, of needing to back this um, entity that we've built up over, or the U.S. has built up over uh, several years, is that it also needs to live and exist on its own, but it can't do so without initially latching on to what US support provides, but that the people underneath the governing structure of the, the AANES and self-administration um, also need to rely on the SDF and the AANES to be that structure to provide without the, the Americans, right? So there's that interesting dichotomy that I think a lot of uh, people in the administration now are trying to focus on and figure out is how do you growth without also um, debilitating the efforts that have been in place over these last uh, several years. I don't know if you want to share this, uh, Sasha, but you had shown um, pre uh, this this um, this event these, the maps of sort of the the trade routes and how complex it is now with who controls what following um, Operation Peace Spring. I don't know if you want to uh, talk a little bit about those before we go into some of these questions that are waiting for us. But I did just want to um, note again that if you'd like to participate or ask one of us. Um, a question, please do so by uh, dropping a note into the Q&A section in Zoom or by emailing policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org and we'll try to get to everyone's as soon as possible. Sasha? Sure. So yeah, I we had built this map after the, the uh, Turkish incursion in 2019 to try and map out kind of 
uh, both trade routes, major trade routes, major roads, because not all of the roads, frankly, had been in use for years because of the advent of the M4. So, for example, like the new Rucka City Membage route and the new Rucka Husaka Road, these were roads that not a lot of people were using previously because the M4 took precedence. It was much better, it was much wider, better built. It it connected back to the Iraq border. Suddenly, these areas have to be used because the M4 is not secure, and. What has happened is that in a lot of these places, that means that there needs to be some sort of force protection, i.e. the SDF has to have checkpoints uh, in these areas and places in order to secure simultaneously. We also have areas where now the Assad regime pre-2019 were not present and they are there now, uh, specifically around the uh, hydroelectric dam of Tubka in Raqqa province. They have places around in Hasika and and around the borders of uh, of the Turkish uh, Syrian border, like in Kobani and Amuda and Komishli in these areas. It's not like the regime has maybe a permanent force present, but they move around and they have the capacity to move, and it creates a very tricky like thing, both in terms of um, stabilization assistance where. Amer American firms and organizations can legally work uh, because obviously the Assad regime is a sanctioned regime and you can't necessarily do all the things that you want to do in this space. Uh, humanitarian aid is exempt, but that's very different than what stabilization is designed to do. Uh, additionally, uh, we have a very lengthy route, this commissionally Derezor route, um, this goes through a very sparsely populated area, a rural area along the Khabur River that was a core ISIS-like area uh, where they held out uh, for quite some time. It took the SDF quite a bit of time with American support to retake this area. Again, since it's sparsely populated, I mean, it's just easy for non-state actors to move in and out and it requires vigilance. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of the work also is about providing these communities with stability, with access and resilience so that number one, they don't feel compelled to move elsewhere, which creates other complex dynamics if you have populations constantly moving around that don't have both economic and, and, uh, and uh, personal stability and security. And also it means that if there's no one there, there's no one to talk to to understand from a security standpoint what's going on and who's doing what and how. So. Uh, finding ways to allow IDPs in this area to return to their homes, live on their land, have stability is also a core security issue in terms of future stability and safety as well. But it also means we have to protect people both against ISIS and the regime. And that's why U.S. force protection for Northeast Syria is so important because it allows real stabilization work to occur on the ground with a degree of certitude that we wouldn't have if the US force protection was not there. And that also provides um, a comfort level to other allies of the United States that are also providing funding and support on the ground. And that is necessary. You had mentioned uh, briefly in the presentation uh, of the maps that there was a possibility for outside investment. Um, and I just wanted to tie that to one of the questions we did get, uh, international investment, not only outside investment. Um, let me see if I can pull it up here. Uh, do, you, uh, do the speakers, do we believe that the area will attract investment from other parts of Syria or from, or from outside of Syria? If yes, why and what kind of investments? And I can speak a little bit about the oil component there, but I just wanted to open it up to Sasha first. And then uh, Jenny, if you had anything that you wanted to include on that. Yeah, I mean, briefly, like cross-border uh, trade between the KRG and the NES region is continuous. The Fischhobor crossing is the only economic lifeline into NES right now uh, due to the current position of the Turkish government really not allowing goods and services that much to move from the areas in Syria that they control or across their border into NES. Uh, if we saw Turkey um, come to a position where it could have some sort of agreement, whether humanitarian or economic in nature with the self-administration authority regarding those border crossings, you would see a lot of investment, I think, going in 
both in terms of the agriculture sector, but also like if we look at what Turkey has done elsewhere in areas that they control in Syria, I mean, they've worked on light to heavy industry. They've worked on manufacturing on Syrian in Syrian areas. Uh, so I could see that. Again, Turkey has a firm and clear relationship with the KRG. Also, so a lot of Turkish goods go into NES via the KRG. So it's not like there's no economic or social relationship between all of these areas. There certainly is. It just may not be the most public. Uh, so if there is a way moving forward to create some sort of agreement between all sides, I think you could see a lot of investment going into NES. But again, US force protection is part of that guarantee so people can feel they can invest safely in an area that frankly is very unstable. Yeah, I would only add briefly to that to say the Russians have over time uh, whittled down the UN authorizations for cross-border aid um, to now a single border crossing in Idlib on uh, farther west. Uh, and the Russians are gearing up to veto even that last crossing uh, this July when the Security Council vote uh, is scheduled to occur. Uh, the U.S. needs to prevent Russia from vetoing that. Now we may lose the Security Council vote. Um, I have argued um, in my testimony last week that the US should work with Turkey and the EU uh, to commit to continued cross-border aid, um, even if Russia does veto that UN authorization, um, both in order to keep you know, a minimum level of humanitarian aid uh, flowing to the populations that desperately need it in Idlib. Um, but the US should also take that opportunity to strike the kind of deal uh, that Sasha, Sasha just framed um, to provide greater aid from Turkey into areas of Northeast Syria. Um, we do need to make sure that Idlib you know, is not choked off from the international aid uh, community, but we need to do even more than that. Um, and I do think this presents an opportunity for the US to align with our NATO ally Turkey uh, against what Russia is trying to do. Uh, and I'd like to see this administration exploit that opportunity uh, to make sure that pipeline or that opportunity for greater economic investment that Sasha mentioned in Eastern Syria can actually occur. And some might point to the economic investment of Delta Crescent Energy, this sort of loosely known uh, faction that's working in Northeastern Syria um, run by um, three Americans um, who, whose deal is not quite clear to the public. Um, and, and that's an effort that people thought were was a little bit harebrained given that the security situation is not that great um, and that uh, you know the US forces aren't necessarily tasked with protecting American investment. That's just not their job. Um, but there is a sort of elephant in the room, right? And, and we haven't really addressed it, that there is another country that could open up border crossings to allow for the trade of, of goods and services and, and also humanitarian aid. Isn't that right? I mean, does the KRG not factor in to how um, the economic relations in the northeast, uh, northeastern Syria are developing, or is that just fundamentally off the table, not even something worth discussing, Sasha? So I think obviously the KRG has social, cultural, political, and economic links to the northeast Syria region. So as I've said for years, Syria and Iraq are inextricably linked by culture and by history, by borders, by language, uh, numerous languages, in fact. So yeah, they, I mean, they're always gonna be politically and economically connected and the impact of one will impact the other. There's no doubt about it. So the KRG can have a positive or negative role, one might say, same as Turkey, can have a positive or negative role about what happens in the trajectory of, uh, of the NES region. Overall, again, like lots of, businesses and people in the KRG are doing business with people in NES. Uh, for example, like if you need a specific type of equipment from, from, you know, the international domain, whether it's Chinese or European, whether it's like a European gen generator or a German pump or a Japanese component, like more than likely you're going to get it from the KRG, from business people who do import and export out of the KRG right now. So there's, those links are there um, and those links could be exploited to create uh, you know, a more stable political interconnectedness that could help uh, this region. But let's not forget also, KRG is also a gray semi-autonomous region adjacent to a gray semi-autonomous region in Northeast Syria. So it is 
from a legal standpoint, probably not the best setup, but it's what we have. However, if the Iraqi government wants to be involved in this, they need to find a way to get the Yarubiya crossing back open. And then we would we would have another way for GOI controlled Iraq to be involved in this process as well, if they want to be. That was gonna be my that was gonna be my devil's advocate was that there is another player in this in this whole spectrum who does have a border crossing that could be beneficial, albeit the Al Qaim border, border crossing has been so porous and that whole stretch along um uh, northeastern Syria has been a, a difficult one at best. Um, let me, I, we have another question here. Um, I wanted to direct toward uh, Jenny. Um, you sort of focused your testimony last week on on, on supporting the AANES, uh, the self-administration. Um, one participant wants to know, do you think that the autonomous authorities governance structure is transparent and accountable to manage financial resources from oil provisions and services, sales to strategic crops, borders, and other resources in the NES in a, in a sustainable way? There's a follow-up question to that, but I wanted to pose it to you because I think that there is this question of, all right, so we've supported this entity, the US has supported this entity for so, so many years, but are they doing it in a way that is beneficial to the U.S. Are they are they being truthful in the way they're positioning themselves and also being open to maybe this um, intra Kurdish positioning or also the the bi, not bipartisanship but also the inclusion of Syriac Christians of the Arab population and so on and so forth. Yeah, thank you to whoever submitted that question because I think it's a very important one. Uh, I have advocated through my testimony or recommended through my testimony um, and through other comments that the U.S continue to support the SDF and the AANES uh, infrastructure. But I think it's also important to recognize that this is not a perfect system. And the US has essentially been kind of dragged along uh, in creating a political reality that the US never actually deliberately set out to create. And I emphasize that because I think sometimes it's easy to assume that the current setup is somehow inevitable or it's too difficult for the US to shape um, the conditions and the delivery of governance in Eastern Syria. And that's just not true. The US has not meaningfully tried because this has not been our priority. Uh, we conducted a military led fight uh, against the Islamic State uh, and ended up with a political reality that we still haven't entirely figured out from a policy perspective how to navigate. And it is in that context that I have recommended both supporting the SDF and its structures, uh, but also uh, conditioning US support and greater US uh, economic and military support on essential reforms that I do actually think need to happen in order to make this structure more viable over the long term. That needs to include political inclusion. It needs to include accountability, uh, for example, for local populations to be able to bring grievances um, and actually have them adjudicated, including grievances in how the SDF is managing security um, or governance, not just you know like within the community uh, grievances. And I do think it also needs to include a hard look at um, transparency, as was mentioned, um, and accountability for those kinds of funds. I think one of the elephants that's still somewhat in the room, I referenced it once, um, but is of course the transnational PKK um, entity that is operating, that is in senior leadership positions with the SDF, um, the Turks are demanding that, that those foreign cadres, um, as they're referred to, withdraw. I think that's a reasonable Turkish demand. Um, I think that's a deeply painful one for the SDF to be able to deliver. Um, I do think it's the kind of transformation that does need to occur in order to make the SDF more viable over time. Um, but I think the U.S. needs to start with nearer term and more achievable reforms that will actually have an immediate impact. Um, among the communities in, in northeastern Syria, um, and especially in Deir Azor, and then try to build confidence from those measures, both with the local population and with Turkey, um, and build confidence with the SDF's leadership that they can succeed um, and survive in eastern Syria, which I think that confidence can actually enable some of the harder concessions that the Turks want um, to be made possible, including that withdrawal of foreign cadres. I, one of the one of the pieces that lacks in a lot of these conversations, both that I have in public and then also in the side, really lacks the question of Turkey. So these reforms that you're referencing, both for the local population, really are also a, a sort of carrot for 
uh, Turkey, right? In, in many ways, they're meant to appease Turkey. And, and a lot of that is viewed through the intra-Kurdish dialogue. And we can look at how the KNC and the PYD are working together to solve this foreign cadres issue that you that you raised. But I wonder, um, I wonder if in your conversation with military leaders and officials and, 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 and people fighting on the, on, on the ground or uh, working on the ground, if no matter what is given to Turkey, it won't seem to satisfy their voracious appetite for concessions. Is that an accurate um, way to way to place it? Because that's how I felt. And that's the sort of framework that my mind was put in when I was speaking with officials and uh, both US and, and uh, Syrian officials when I was in country. But is that your sense too? That there's just, this is gonna, if we give too much, we'll lose too much. And there will always be an ask for more, sorry. Yeah, no, yes, I think it's important. And look, what the US needs to do in Syria is navigate an incredible difficult middle road. We should not just supercharge, uh, you know, the Kurdish leadership of the SDF and say, you know, screw the Turks. Um, we're just going to go all in with the SDF structure. And neither should we say, all right, we're going to give Turkey anything it wants in eastern Syria so that Turkey will stop escalating. Neither of those extreme options are possible. The U.S. has to forge a middle ground. And to do that, the U.S. has to recognize that Turkey is both an ally and an adversary in Syria simultaneously. So we can't operate under the assumption that they're an ally and they're going to behave like an ally. And if we grant them concessions, they're going to give us concessions, right, in good faith, like we would with, you know, say the UK, if we ever disagreed um, on, on the policy in Syria. That's not going to happen. But the Turks have demonstrated that they can be pragmatic. And the Turks have demonstrated that American leverage does actually change Turkish calculus. So we need to grant some concessions. Um, but we also need to put leverage on the table. And I would simply end by emphasizing that it was the threat of American sanctions on key Turkish officials that halted that Turkish incursion in late 2019. Um, that was a serious piece of leverage the U.S. put on the table, and it worked. Um, so what the U.S. has to do is both. Um, grant the concessions that we need to grant anyway in order to make this locally viable um, as a governing entity. Um, use that in order to take some of the steam out of the sails or the wind out of the sails of the Turkish claims that the SDF is illegitimate. Um, but we need to do that while actually keeping leverage on the table. And I think Sasha also has mentioned that the continued US presence is an incredibly important uh, source of leverage. So I think we need to strengthen that um, and consider what other you know, sticks the US needs to bring to the table to get Erdogan um, actually to stop escalating and hopefully over time to recognize the strategic value of aligning what the Turks are building in the North um, and what the U.S. is building farther east, because there actually is a great opportunity for alignment there. Um, and over time, we need to make that more possible to achieve. So I think, Ken, uh, just to follow up on that, one of the main leverage points the United States has is the explanation of how long they will be present on the ground. So if we say we're going to be, I'm going to use Jenny's timeline, five years, if we say we're gonna be there five years, now Turkey knows, okay, the United States is going to be here for five years. For the next five years, we have to navigate accordingly how we're gonna deal with this region and this area and the United States presence. Simultaneously, it's going to tell Russia, Iran, all our other adversaries in the region, okay, the Americans are here for five years. By by the standards of the Middle East, five years is nothing time-wise, but it's, I know it's a lot for the United States. So maybe five years is, is the best we can do, but at least for those five years, we know that we're gonna be there, people are gonna invest because five years is enough time for someone to make a safe, safe bet and say, okay, maybe I can invest for the next five years with some assurance. There will be a, 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 a different calculus of all of the, of the entities and actors on the ground once the United States makes clear how long we can be, but also internally for the United States, we can commit to certain types of programs and for how long and for what they will achieve on a five-year term basis that would be very difficult. Like certain things you cannot achieve in six month intervals or one year intervals from a programmatic standpoint. But if I have five years to implement a program in Derazor, I can probably achieve more comprehensive, holistic uh, objectives, knowing that that's my time frame. So we need to create time and space to be able to achieve what we want to achieve. But to do that, we have to say explicitly how long we're going to stay for. And I, I would simply uh, add, thanks, Sasha, uh, for bringing up the, the question of the duration of the commitment. I have advocated that the U.S. should set 
uh, goals on a five-year time frame. in that we should expect we can achieve a set of conditions, including, you know, strengthening the SDF uh, in a five-year span. But I do not recommend um, putting five years as the end date of the American involvement. Uh, that would be completely counterproductive uh, because among other things, it will signal to our adversaries that they can just wait us out. Um, and so I think five years is a reasonable scope of time for the U.S. to pursue interim goals and then reevaluate uh, what level of continued American support is necessary at that time, hopefully at a reduced level, um, if that five years is, is spent wisely. Despite this notion that we, we seem to change or often change presidencies and administrations every four years, right, uh, is also a, a haywire um, hand grenade into the mix. But um, I think partners on the ground are understanding that we, we aren't necessarily um, uh, as in flux as we have been in the past, though we are, I guess, under a, a policy anal a policy review for Syria. So there's, there is still some unclarity there. Uh, I just want to note again to our attendees that if you do have questions, please uh, keep them coming in the Q&A within Zoom or send a note to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. We have about just a little under 10 minutes left. Um, someone brought up a really interesting question about um, the results of the currency devaluation on local populations. They are asking specifically about Raqqa um, and how the AANES is adapting to hyperinflation, what coping, coping mechanisms are residents and IDPs resorting to. Um, I know from, from my reporting that I saw the AANES um, raise salaries for many of the SDF personnel to try to compensate for the loss in value of their salaries um, post COVID, um, post the, um, the, 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 the devaluing of the, the Syrian pound. Um, I wonder if either of you have any insight into this at all. I know that I've also seen some um, real uh, entrepreneurial endeavors in, sort, in terms of selling IDP, um, UNCHR tents online to try to make uh, money and, and also um, also considering the, the radicalization route and going back uh, to ISIS. So um, Jenny, do you wanna pick that up or, or maybe Sasha? Sure, I, I would just um, offer that I think the question of IDPs, which we've touched on a couple times but haven't addressed head on, um, is actually very urgent, both from a humanitarian situation, um, but also in the context of the counter ISIS campaign. Um, you mentioned, Ken, the inflow of, of IDPs back to communities in the Middle East Euphrates River Valley. Um, the conditions are not good for those uh, IDPs to return. There's a similar catastrophe happening on the Iraqi side of the border that is going to breathe life back into ISIS by forcing IDPs back into their communities uh, before they're ready. And I would simply add that, look, the economic prospects in Syria are horrible across the board. And that's because of the Assad regime, its mismanagement, um, and the consequences of the collapse of the economy in Lebanon, which by the way, has a lot owed to Lebanese Hezbollah and Iran's regional campaign. Um, U.S. sanctions are, of course, blocking the Assad regime from profiting more from the war, um, but it's actually the regime um, and the way that it has conducted this war effort that has created this economic crisis in the East. I raise that because it means the solutions to this economic situation and the solutions to providing life-saving support to these communities, including the IDPs, are not going to come from Damascus or from Assad's backers. Those actors would love to get an influx of international currency to repay themselves for their war effort, but it's not going to improve the situation in the Northeast. So the SDF is, is suffering from the downstream consequences of, of that mismanagement um, in the war effort in the West, but the US can provide alternate options to stabilize this economic situation. And I, I do think it's vital that we, that we provide those options. Um, Sasha has already conducted a great overview um, of the kinds of cross-border trade and international investment that, that we can make possible. Um, as you mentioned, Ken, the SDF has applied some mitigation measures um, that buys time, but it doesn't solve this crisis, um, which unfortunately is not going to go away anytime soon. So I think it should be a priority uh, for this administration with an emphasis on those IDPs, including the all whole IDP camp, which we haven't really touched on, um, but remains a very dangerous and you know potentially a powder keg situation. I will, I will plug my own uh, piece in the FICRA forum on uh, the Washington Institute website about Al Hall and the efforts that the international community can um, seek out to um, better ensure the safety of the people and families and children living in that um, 
it's not even a camp anymore. It's a miniature city, 60,000 people. Um, and that link is on the washinginstitute.org website. Um, I just wanted to also note quickly, there have been some questions about whether or not uh, the situation in Northeastern Syria and America's involvement will lead to an independent entity in this region. And I just wanna clarify that uh, myself included and the panelists have been very careful to call it Northeastern Syria to, to note that it's a governing structure um, that the ANES has formed. And that's in part due to the sort of difficult nature in which the region finds itself uh, and the legitimacy of any governing body or governing structure within that region um, in the broader uh, civil war across the country. So I just wanted to make that as a broad note. Uh, Sasha, was there something you wanted to uh, chime in with about the, the uh, Syrian pound? Well, I just wanted to note, like, so from the perspective of the INGOs, the NGOs, the development firms, we all work in dollars. I mean, we pay everyone in dollars and people choose the moment to convert their dollars into local currency when it's required. Otherwise, everyone keeps dollars reserves basically on them at all times. And because of our complex international financial system that includes a myriad of counterterrorism laws, and this could be a whole different discussion, um, moving money and moving support, financially speaking, into the region is very complex. It's very difficult. And it also, frankly, makes those of us who work in stabilization and humanitarian aid, our job that much more difficult because yes, we cannot pay people in local currency. No one would ever accept it. And more importantly, all of our budget would be like devalued in like two seconds. And then whatever we like budgeted out for programming wouldn't, wouldn't apply anymore. So there's a definite real need to figure out this angle and find a more stable and secure way of providing financial uh, support and aid, but also funding through secure uh, financial mechanisms uh, to the ground. And that is something that we have faced in Syria for 10 years now. So it's an ongoing problem. I'm looking through some of these last questions here. We have about two minutes, maybe. Um, and I do wanna give you all a chance to have final thoughts, but I think there is um, a really good question that might uh, cancel out any need for us to have final thoughts. Um, I think so. So someone's asking the the AANES ran a fairly significant budget deficit in the past year, according to its own documents. I think I know who's asking this. Has that impacted its ability to govern at all? Um, was the deficit purely due to oil price crashes, or do we anticipate ongoing budget problems as a chronic issue for the AANES? So I think that last component of the question, like, will these budget problems, uh, and Jenny and I touched on this very briefly, will those budget problems hamper any sort of intra-Kurdish dialogue? Will it hamper their ability to move uh, to Geneva, if that is even still a goal? And will it hamper any ability to, to continue working alongside US forces? So I'll give both of you, I guess, 30 seconds each, if you could answer very briefly, and then we'll wrap this up. Jenny? Sure, so I would say I, I don't have terribly much more insight into the specifics of the SDF budget. Um, I would offer that there's another elephant in that room regarding you know, what is the financial connectivity to the PKK candle? Um, I don't see people talking about that, but it's it definitely merits uh, consideration because this is still a transnational entity in some important respects. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the the broader point behind the question is whether the SDF is viable, right, over the long term. Um, and the answer is essentially yes, in that it can continue to struggle along, limp along in this conflict, uh, but no, in the sense that every drop of American and international assistance is actually crucial to enabling this entity to continue. Will that make a deal with Turkey possible in the near term? No, I don't think it's enough just to keep the SDF alive, right? Um, they need more leverage and the US needs to supply that. Uh, and it certainly won't you know, lead to an end to the conflict, but all of Syria is broke, right? It's not just the SDF. So the SDF is actually relatively better off than essentially everybody else uh, in Syria. Uh, and I think that's important to keep in mind because we need to put this into the context of the fractured society within which the SDF operates, you know, and not impose our sort of Western expectations on, is this a viable governing entity? Because objectively, you know, no, but within Syria, yeah, it's actually doing pretty good. Uh, and I think it can continue with a, a reasonably small American commitment. That was longer than 30 seconds, but I'll turn it over to Sasha. Sasha, very briefly. Yes, um, given the types of nat natural resources the NES region has, it could be a self-sustaining economic unit uh, to do that, it has to figure out a couple things, governance, uh, political participation. At some point, the ANES needs a tax base. 
And in order to get people to participate in that tax base, they need to feel politically involved on multiple levels. So it's sort of a chicken and the egg scenario in terms of this issue. But long term, I think that would be the ultimate route they need to go down. They need to figure out uh, more concrete and less arbitrary import duties for economic uh, inputs. And frankly, they need another viable route other than fiscal border crossing uh, to bring goods and services from the outside world in. So just briefly, those are some thoughts on how to do this. But yes, stabilization aid, humanitarian aid and support are still crucial to keeping uh, this region viable and stable. Thank you. The chicken and the egg is a is a is a is an important idiom that is being used often to describe the situation in Syria. But I, I want to just take a quick second to say thank you uh, to our panelists Jennifer and Sasha for joining me um, here at the Institute for this policy forum. Um, I greatly appreciate the enlightening discussion, and I'm sure we'll have more into the future as we see how the U.S. sides with its policy review on Syria. Thank you all, everyone, and have a wonderful day.